Today on the Perception in Action podcast, a look at Claire Michael's 10 Commandments for Ecological Psychology and their implications for skill acquisition research and coaching. Why are the principles of the ecological approach a package deal? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about my new book. Yes, I've written a new book on skill acquisition called How We Learn to Move, A Revolution in the Way We Coach and Practice Sports Skills. It covers the ecological approach to skill from different angles, including practice design, the CLA, coaching, youth sports, designing technology, injury prevention, and using analytics. So I hope you will consider giving it a read. You can find the book on Amazon or by going to perceptionaction.com forward slash book. Now on to the show. In today's episode, I want to take a look at the great paper, A Ten Commandments for Ecological Psychology by Claire Michaels and Zolt Palatinus and consider how we can extend this to think about skill acquisition and training. Before I begin, I will note that I share the author's concern expressed at the start of their paper. Quote, It is with mixed feelings that we adopt the label Ten Commandments. The danger is that it will bolster the view held by some that ecological psychologists, Gibsonians, are more like religious fanatics than the conservative, open-minded scientists that we are. We brave that danger to make the point that just as observant followers of religion ought not to pick and choose which commandments they follow, advocates of ecological psychology or of genuinely embedded and embodied cognitive science should see our commandments as a package deal. Some psychologists select their principles and concepts cafeteria style, adopting ideas they like and leaving others behind, and even declare that being eclectic is a virtue. Unfortunately, the major principles of ecological psychology are deeply connected and intertwined. To subscribe to some and discard the others always entails contradiction. End quote. For me, this is a really important point that I want to emphasize here today. The ecological approach is a collection of ideas that extends and connects from the roots of the theory direct perception. I often see opponents of our ecological psychology pick out one of these, for example, non-linearity or embodiment, and show how it can be incorporated into an indirect internal model approach. They then claim something to the effect that they've shown how the ecological approach is unnecessary or meaningless. The ecological approach is more than just affordances, or coupling, or embodiment, or self-organization. As I hopefully illustrated in my book, it's all of these ideas together connected. As I discussed a couple episodes ago, when looking at the difference between online versus offline and direct versus indirect perception, it is also the case that you can't just sample from the ecological approach, using some of its principles some of the time. For example, a model that is direct for part of the event and indirect for another. It is a package deal. You have to follow all of the commandments all of the time. So let's try to understand this more by looking at each of these from the paper. Commandment number one. Thou shall not separate organism and environment. This is why we call it ecological, my friends. While traditionally we have adopted a dualistic, asymmetric approach to skill where we can understand and train the performer separate from the environment, in the ecological approach we argue for a symmetrical performant environment mutuality. That is, the performer and the environment is a system that should not be broken apart. This mutuality has numerous implications for understanding skill. For example, instead of just looking at the world in terms of abstract units of physics, distances, size, etc., we look at the world in conjunction with the performer. We look for affordances, opportunities for action instead. Commandment number two, thou shall not take the name information in vain. To quote the article, The term information serves many masters in science and engineering, but ecological psychology singles out a particular meaning and uses it in this restrictive sense. Information is a pattern in space and time that specifies the state of affairs of the organism environment system. By specifies is meant relates to uniquely or relates to -to one-to-one. Gibson's concept of information was a radical departure from the assumption of perceptual theories from Greeks through Helmholtz once 
Tickner, the Gestalts, and their modern counterparts in cognitive neuroscience. The Helmholtzian view assumes that the information to the senses is non-specifying, indeed impoverished, and therefore requires that the perceiver engage in computational, comparative, and memorial processes that serve to embellish this input. End quote. So using some examples to illustrate, if your opponent bends their knees 80% of the time when they serve cross-court and they're bending their knees now, that is not information in the ecological Gibsonian sense because it does not uniquely specify an event in the environment. Detecting that the next pitch will be a fastball based on the pitcher's grip is not information either because it does not specify an action-relevant variable. Knowing that a pitch is a fastball cannot be used to directly generate the movement to hit it. These are cues, not information. Commandment number three, thou shalt regard perception as the detection of information. This follows naturally from our definition of information. Quote, the premise is simple. If information patterns specify the objects and events, then perception of those objects and events is simply a matter of detecting this information. Also, quote, if a candidate variable does not account for the variance in reports or actions, it is rejected and the search for a successful candidate continues. Failure of a variable is simply that. It is not disproof of direct perception, end quote. If, for example, we find that a baseball batter is not using tau to time their swing, that does not mean that direct perception theory is incorrect and they're doing some type of internal processing and prediction. It just means we haven't found the right information source yet and need to look harder. I can tell you personally this has happened to me a few times in my work. Commandment number four, thou shalt not compute. Again, perception is direct detection of information, not information processing. This is true for any type of computation, no matter how you define it, if there is specifying information available in the environment. For an alternative to computational approaches, the authors point to Runson's idea of the smart perceptual mechanism, which I discussed back in episode 362. Quote, the alternative to a storage comparison computational metaphor is Runson's smart perceptual device. A smart perceptual device detects information. It does not detect low-level stimulus properties and from them compute other properties or embellish them with additional information from memory. End quote. Listen back to episode 362 and my description of the planimeter for a specific example of this type of device. Commandment number five, thou shalt not separate perception and action, aka keep them coupled. As I discussed a couple episodes ago when talking about why switch sides, the coordination of action is not simply subservient to perception, it is embedded within it and linked to it. As the authors note, quote, the concept of affordances already reflects the intimacy of perception and action. Organisms perceive actions that they can enter into with respect to other organisms, objects, events, and places. Affordances, however, are only part of the perception action story. Two other aspects deserve mention. One is exploration. Perceivers engage in a variety of acts that make information available, looking, sniffing, savoring, but is the haptic sense that most obviously depends on exploratory movements, such as palpating, rubbing, hefting, wielding, etc. Second, performatory actions also reveal information appropriate for their own guidance. End quote. As an example of this second point, consider the bearing angle model of steering. If I'm running to tackle an opponent in football and turn my body sharply to the right, this will cause the bearing angle to increase. Turning back to the left reduces this increase. Action changes information in a functional way, or as the authors put it, optics structured by an act can serve to refine it, end quote. Commandment number six, thou shalt have only one science before thee. This is a really interesting point. To quote the authors, what ought to be the relation between psychology and physical science? Are the phenomena of living and behaving systems so different from the phenomena of non-living and non-behaving systems that the respective sciences overlap little or not at all? The growing ecological view is that there is one science or there is none, end quote. For me, this really encapsulates the idea that human beings are just another complex dynamical system like other animals and physical systems in our world. We don't need to look for a special mechanism to explain human behavior that is fundamentally different than the ones that explains these other dynamical physical systems. We don't need to infer special mental states and processes. The examples that the authors use is coordination between two moving objects. 
in one case between two pendulums, and the other case between two limbs of a human being. Quote, in both cases, only certain phase relations are stable. While the two coupling phenomena differ in a number of ways, for example, mechanical versus information coupling, does one really need a new set of natural laws to explain the tendency for two fingers or limbs to oscillate in unison? And if it turns out that the limbs of two people show the same attraction, as it has turned out, does one need yet another natural law to explain the social version of this phenomenon? Instead, one ecological tack is to seek analogous phenomenon in the physical world and to exploit the laws that explain them. End quote. Commandment number seven, thou shalt not steal intelligence. Saying that perception action requires some previous knowledge, mental model, motor program to interpret and use the incoming sensory information is just borrowing money that most researchers and theorists can never pay back. Specifically, no one ever explains where the knowledge came from or how the motor program was developed in the first place. Gibson expressed their frustration with this. Quote, knowledge of the world cannot be explained by supposing that knowledge of the world already exists, end quote. As the authors wonderfully put it, quote, until one can explain how the pre-existing pattern or recipe arose, the putative explanation is just a scientific shell game, end quote. This is very similar to the point I raised in my Switching Sides episode. Taking an event in the outside world and making it an event in your head, a prediction, a decision, an anticipation, is just shifting the card around under the shells. In the ecological approach, we don't have to repay this loan on intelligence or knowledge because we assume learning is direct, resulting from mere changes in the system, like calibration, rather than increasing these knowledge stores. Commandment number eight, thou shalt honor, exploit, and enlarge physical law. This is similar to the point about following one science and basically the motivation behind extending dynamical systems theory into understanding human behavior. Let's take principles like oscillators, attractors, etc., that explain behavior in non-physical systems very well that share similar properties instead of trying to come up with whole new laws for human beings. Quote, Nobody thinks that using these tools is easy, but surely it's a better way to start than by begging the question or proliferating whole sciences to explain patterns at each level. Honoring, exploiting, and enlarging physical law as it applies to behavioral and cognitive phenomenon is, we think, a more promising strategy. End quote. Commandment number nine. Thou shalt not make unto thee any mental image or likeness of anything. Quote. As noted earlier, philosophy and psychology have separated organism and environment and erected barriers between them, for example, impoverished stimuli. For contact to be had with the environment, it had to be recreated, represented in the brain or mind. While philosophers have already acknowledged that some processes are less representation-hungry than others, the ecological commitment is to stand its ground. No representations, period. End quote. For many, I think this refusal to attribute absolutely any part of skill to internal mental processes is just seen to be unnecessary stubbornness, but it's actually a really important part of the ecological approach, both on the theoretical and applied coaching level. The reason is that appealing to a mental representation always just gives an out when faced with a difficult problem. Finding information sources and control laws is hard and can be very complex. Imagine I'm trying to find a variable used by an athlete to do some difficult timing maneuver. If, when the going gets tough, I can just say that that's calculated in the head or based on internal memory or knowledge, I can essentially give up the search for the information source in the environment. Which, remember, if we really accept Gibson's view of direct perception, is always waiting there for us to be found. This parallels a problem I see in coaching. If we don't truly accept that skill is best developed through exploration and self-organization and allow for prescription as an option, then a coach is less likely to let practice activities run for long enough and allow for iterations on them that will improve skill in the long run. Commandment number 10, thou shalt change with experience. Here, of course, the authors are talking about the concept of direct learning. I remember myself early in my career, one of the main things people always criticized in the ecological approach was that it did not really allow for learning and improvement. In Gibson's original strict conception of per direct perception, we always use specifying information. If that is the case, how could we get better? We can't improve on the direct perception of information. 
This was addressed in direct learning theory by allowing for the possibility that we could start by controlling our action with non-specifying information, then move towards specifying as we practice. This change in information used, the education of attention, change in the aspect or a movement that is controlled, education of intention, and the link between the two, calibration, form the basis of learning without knowledge stores and representation. Quote, direct learning is in some ways at odds with the third commandment, that perceivers always exploit specifying information. This departure was motivated by observations that sometimes more variance in novice perceivers' judgments and performance is accounted for by non-specifying variables than by specifying ones. Indeed, Jacobs and Michaels propose that perceivers in novel situations are likely to use such variables. So what was needed was a theory that explains how perceivers come to use specifying information. The theory does not abandon specificity, but invokes it at the level of learning rather than perception. While direct learning is not mainstream ecological theory, it's included here because it illustrates in a simple way, we hope, ecological concepts have been continual sticking points for psychologists and philosophers, learning without storage, representation, or memory, end quote. I will end by giving the author's conclusion paragraph. Ten do's and don'ts have been outlined. In many ways, they can be distilled down to one. Respect the integrity of the system under investigation. It cannot be indiscriminately decomposed into parts. The backdrop is, is that the so-called parts depend for their nature and function on the other parts. While it may make sense to take a clock apart, describe the parts, and assess their functions and interrelations, the same cannot be said of a living, knowing systems. If one nevertheless persists in decomposition, then the task is to re-embody the parts or parts and re-embed them in a context. These endeavors are not necessary tasks for cognitive science. They are paying for one's mistakes. Our Ten Commandments are meant to promote a more unitary view, both of the organism of environment system and of natural science with which you study it. End quote. For me, we can create a similar message for coaching and skill acquisition. The assumption has long been that skill is best acquired by breaking it apart, through learning the quote-unquote fundamentals by prescribing, isolating, and repeating them. If we persist in doing this, we create a problem of having then to regame and recontextualize these fundamentals, having to train the athlete to decide when and how to use them. This is not a necessary task that coaches have to do. Poor decision-making is a problem we've created for ourselves. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakeweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Gunther's and Lewis.